So, thanks again for turning up. Uh, it's my third time here at Berlin Buzzwords. Last year I talked about Kafka streams with, I think, 30 plus degrees Celsius. It's so cool to be here without sweating all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope it's the same for you. Um, so, I'll talk for about the next half hour uh, about KSQL, which is a distributed streaming SQL engine for Kafka. And first, uh, a few words about myself. So I work at Confluent, and uh, before I start, who knows Confluent? Who knows who Confluent is? Okay, that's almost everyone. Um, for the few of you who don't, uh, Confluent is the company founded by the creators of Apache Kafka. We're based in the United States. I'm actually based in Switzerland, working from remote. So we are a pretty distributed team. And uh, I joined Confluent about three years ago on the engineering team, but since then have moved to product management and now responsible for stream processing with Kafka and Confluent. And specifically, this is Kafka Streams, which I talked about last year, and KSQL, which is what I cover today. So that was a few bits about myself. Let me know you a little bit more. Who of you is using Kafka? Raise your hand. Almost everyone, again. Um, who of you is using um, Kafka Streams? Okay. Who of you is using or has learned that there is something called KSQL? Okay. A lot. Um, who of you knows SQL, like the traditional SQL, like MySQL, Postgres, and so on? Okay, everyone. Cool. So this is cool because one of the things that I want to talk about in this uh, session is the world of streaming with Apache Kafka, as shown here, and the world of databases. And one thing I will talk about in particular is that there is a very close relationship between the two. They like each other very much. So, and to set the stage for this, um, we are a pretty international audience here at Berlin Buzzwords. So, uh, in order to get here, you typically would have to book a flight, reserve a hotel, order a cab or a taxi, um, probably listen to some music on your way here. Maybe you select to your colleagues right here because you still have to do some work. And as it turns out, a lot of these daily activities are nowadays powered by Kafka behind the scenes, whether you know it or not. So uh, is there anyone here that wants to say like one or two sentences about how they're using Kafka? Maybe one of the speakers around here that don't feel shy to speak up? <laughs> okay, some people are a bit hesitant, but they don't want to talk about it. Okay, but I have an escape hatch. So since we tech people tend to be introverts, here is a, uh, an example that I think should still be relevant to uh, most people here, at least if you're working for like a company in the private industry. So a lot of times what you do at a company is that you're getting a lot of signals about your customer through a variety of internal channels and through a variety of external channels. So and what typically uh, you would like to do in a company is to aggregate all this information that you know about your customer and then create consolidated customer profiles. That could be used for a variety of things, such as if you're doing fraud detection, you want to know that a person is currently in Berlin, so it seems to be a fraudulent activity if the credit card of the person is suddenly being used somewhere in Argentina. And there are a variety of scenarios where these things can help. And as you can see here, what we're looking at at a very high conceptual level is you uh, have a lot of input data, in this example, in the form of streams, and you want to process that in real time into a table, something like a normal database. So we'll talk about that later on in, in a variety of different facets. So here is where KSQL enters the picture. So as I mentioned before, KSQL is the streaming SQL engine for Apache Kafka. And at a very high level, here is how you would use that. So you have your data in Kafka, and like in the motivating example, information and signals about your customers, and then you want to process their data. You want to analyze it, peek into it, and so on. And with KSQL, you would run KSQL, and I'll show you what it means to run KSQL, at the perimeter of your Kafka cluster, and then we'll talk across the network to a Kafka cluster in order to read data, write data, and so on. So very much like running Kafka Streams application, for those of you who've raised the hand earlier, that they're using this either for writing Java applications or Scala applications. And 
that's also all you need, right? You don't need anything else. You don't need to install an Hadoop cluster because you want to have fault-tolerant stream processing. That's why you need HDFS and so on. Um, that's all you need. And I won't go through this thing here in detail, but in case you want to <laughs> take like a reference uh, picture, here are some of the cool properties of KSQL in a nutshell. I will talk about primarily the top half, uh, the top part, and uh, a little bit of the bottom half, but I will skip over exactly once processing. I'll skip over Kafka security. So if anyone here is in finance or some other heavily regulated industry, there is not much information in this talk, but feel free to talk, uh, to, talk to me afterwards. So just some things that I will cover in the next few minutes. So before there was KSQL, the way that you would process your data in Kafka through Kafka streams would look some, somewhat like this. So here is a, a Scala application, like an end-to-end -end Scala application that reads from Kafka uh, and you know, applies some simple you know, fraud detection uh, logic on the input data in real time and then writes the results back to Kafka. So apart from the import statements, this is literally the application that you would have to write in this scenario. And it would run on a single machine, a single container. It could run on dozens of machines, dozens of containers, and, and even more. Even so, a lot of people that we work with, and a lot of people that have used Kafka, said that oh, this is still quite a high barrier for people to use, either because they're not Java experts, or Scala experts for that matter, or because they are so busy doing other things that it just takes them too long to implement Java or Scala applications and then you know, deploy them and so on. So with KSQL, all of these lines of codes, and you know, I'm, I'm a developer by trade, so for me, I would be okay with the above, uh, the one that I just showed before, but all of that collapses down to this single SQL statement. So you don't need to write any um, Java or Scala code, you don't need to embed those SQL statements inside some other application or some kind of processing job, that's all you need. And one of the niceties of that is that you have a much faster and more interactive workflow. So with Kafka streams or you know, similar tools, you would write your code in Java or Scala, then you know, compile it, package it, run and deploy it, and so on, versus with KSQL, you just write your statement and that's it. This is super cool if you're you know, sitting down at lunchtime, you have this cool idea, and you say, well, let's just let me see what happens if I do this. And then you know, do very quick iterations on your idea. This is super cool for that. Um, we've seen that uh, also being used, for example, by operations people, so SREs that want to figure out why was this message not processed. So take a look at, take, let's take a look at all the data that happened you know, yesterday and see whether there is anything you know, particularly problematic in the message that we got from this particular customer during this time period and so on. So when I say um, KSQL, how would you use that? So I showed the KSQL command line interface here. There are three ways that you could use KSQL. Uh, at the moment. One is through the CLI, you know, a bit like a MySQL or Postgres prompt where you can type in your queries. You can use uh, a modern web UI for that, shown in the middle, and you can also use a REST API. And that is for people that like the SQL part, but they still want to drive it through their favorite programming language, like you know, a Go microservice um, or you know, JavaScript, for example. Here's a simple REST API example, how that would look like. And uh, what you can do with the REST API is either what I'm showing here is you, s you know, sending a query and the results are streamed back in real time to the client, but you can also um, submit a statement such as creating a table, creating a stream, and kind of like submit that query to KSQL, and then it keeps running behind the scenes for you. So that was a, a quick introduction and a high-level overview of KSQL. So what can you do with that? Take a sip. It's not as hot as it was last year, but it's still hot. So one of the first things that people typically with KSQL in our experience is that they just enjoy looking at their data. So it's very cool if you want to explore your data in Kafka. So you know there are ways for you to see the topics available in your Kafka cluster. You can peek into what is actually inside a topic. So you know, oh, this is actually the one that I want to look at because I have this idea about you know combining customer uh, activities with you know, profits that we get from some external partner. And of course, you can do the normal SQL style of you know, selecting your data and so on. What you can, of course, also do is you can use it to enrich your data. So you could say that I have some, a payment stream. 
um, of incoming financial transactions, and I want to enrich that with customer profile information, like you know, the very motivating example at the beginning, and then I can make more informed decisions downstream whether or not I would flag for some of these transactions fraudulent or not. So it goes back to this idea, if the customer is currently in Berlin and the transaction happens in Argentina, probably this is an indication that something fishy is going on. So what Casico supports here is you know, joins, like stream table joins, and so on, where you can combine data sources in real time. You can also use it for things such as uh, streaming ETL or real-time ETL. So you can use it to filter data, cleanse data. So if those of you in the room who, like me, receive dozens of emails about, hey, this is our updated privacy notice, there's this thing called GDPR, um, please read our new privacy policy. So a lot of these companies were also using KSQL in order to make sure that you know, data is being anonymized or pseudonymized uh, appropriately in order to comply with GDPR. And of course, there's a bunch of other things that if you're working in that space, you have probably had a whole lot of fun in the past few months. Similarly, you can use it for anomaly detection. So a very simple example was from the beginning. Here's another one, straightforward, so that I, I can fit it on one slide. So what we're doing here is we're aggregating the raw input data, then we're making some you know, heuristics or some thresholding on the aggregates that we have just computed in real time, and then saying, okay, if more than X authorization attempts failed in a certain time period, then this looks like something bad is going on. So then we want to alert. We want to follow up. For people that work in an IoT space, whether it's like connected cars, you know, uh, earthquake sensors, whatever that is, um, you can do the same thing here. So you can look at the data in real time, aggregate it, and then alert, follow up, you know, create actions and trigger things off of that as well. And of course, it can be used for more mundane tasks. So oftentimes in Kafka, what you like to do is you want to convert data, for example. So let's say your input data is in JSON, but you want to have it in Afro or you want to repartition your data because you want to scale out. That is very easy to do with case you could, you know, with a one-liner. We're saying that I want to have, for example, this many partitions, or I want to have this uh, output data format. In this case, we are converting whatever format the input stream is into JSON format. Now, where is case SQL not, su not such a great fit? Uh, case SQL is a streaming SQL engine. So it is not optimized for, you know, random lookup of arbitrary fields in your data. So for example, if you're looking for one specific message in a stream of uh, Kafka messages, it will not return this in constant time, like probably database with indexes would. And for the same reason, it's also not such a great fit for you know, the, the traditional BI tooling. Well, because as I mentioned, there are no indexes yet in case SQL. Um, also because there is no JDBC driver yet. Well, there is a community one, but not one uh, part of the case SQL project. But also because a lot of these tools in, in this space are not yet working well with continuously updated streaming results. So they are, they are not good at working with your data in real time. That is another reason, which goes beyond uh, what case SQL does or does not. So how does case SQL work? If you were here last year when I talked about Kafka Streams, I talked about how Kafka Streams uh, was usable in production right from the very beginning because 90% of the hard problems it had to solve were already solved by Kafka, the foundation of Kafka Streams. So Kafka Streams was standing on the shoulders of the Kafka giants, or the you know, streaming giants. And KSQL does the same thing. So KSQL itself is built on top of the Kafka Streams API, which in turn is built on top of the Kafka producer and consumer API. <coughs> so which then begs the question, well, this looks actually pretty cool across the board, but when should I use either of those? Can I combine them? So first, yes, you can combine them. So it's pretty common that, for example, someone is using Kafka streams to you know, massage the input data, and I give an example for when you would want to use that, and then hand it over to you know, a KSQL-based workflow. And then this is then being taken uh, into another Kafka streams workflow and so on. So people are doing that a lot. And the way I would juxtapose them is, the higher up you go in this pyramid, the more you get ease of use at the expense of flexibility in what you can express in your application. So for example, if you're using the Kafka consumer or the producer, you can really work on like the nuts and bolts of Kafka. 
So you can subscribe to a Kafka topic, you can peek inside the Kafka topic, etc. So it's like you know, you're soldering iron working with Kafka. If you're going further up the stack, you get Kafka Streams, which um, gives you actually two APIs. One is a functional programming style API called the Kafka Streams DSL, and one is an imperative style, more like you know, event at a time processing way uh, called the processor API. So what you uh, do here is, you know, this example is the DSL, it's you know, very Scala collections like, you know, filter map, flat, uh, flat map, and so on. And then on top of that is KSQL, which essentially gives you a SQL way to express your processing logic. And that is also how I would juxtapose those in terms of when you would want to use them. So for, imagine this example here. So here's KSQL at the top and the same kind of uh, logic at the bottom for Kafka Streams. Now, where would you not use KSQL? Because it looks pretty simple in the rich sense, like not a, mo not a lot of moving parts, right? There's this one thing that it does. Um, a good example that I like to use is, for example, if you have to implement a finite state machine. It's something that doesn't really flow naturally, in my opinion, in any kind of SQL tool, but a real program actually is pretty good at that. So we've seen some customers that work on network telemetry data, where they are getting raw um, network traffic packets, and they're stitching together TCP sessions. And in TCP, there is a finite state machine that tells you here's a connection that is being established, and then it's continuing, and at the end, it's being uh, closed. And that is something that I think fits more naturally into a program language where you can build your finite state machines and so on. This is not something that I think fits very well into the SQL world. In terms of architecture, now how does that all work behind the scenes? So with KSQL, there's, there's just one thing, really, that, that does the work, and that is the KSQL server, which is a JVM process. And the server has two parts. There is the KSQL engine and the KSQL REST API. The REST API allows you to interact with the server. And you start the server with a simple command. And that could be on a physical machine, like your laptop, when you just download it and want to play with it for the first time. It can be a Docker container. It can be... Uh, on-prem, it can be in the cloud, it can be public or private cloud, it doesn't matter. Works as well as OpenShift, uh, on OpenShift as it does somewhere in a VMware-based setup, on GCP, or you know, with Google, uh, Google Cloud or Confluent Cloud. The actual processing happens in the engine, and as I mentioned earlier, this is based on Kafka Streams. So the engine in KSQL use, uh, utilizes the Kafka Streams API to do the processing. And as I mentioned earlier, there are a couple of ways they can use um, these KSQL servers interactively, either through a UI, through a CLI, or by driving the REST API directly in your favorite programming language. So, and just to stress the fact, again, that I mentioned earlier, because I think this is super important, um, KSQL, just like Kafka Streams, it runs everywhere. So wherever you can deploy a JVM process, you can deploy this. And that means it is equally viable for a super small scale, use case, like a proof of concept or prototype, or for very large scale production setup. And that I think is pretty cool because typically with other, you know, particularly like the big data um, tools that originate in the big data world is you have to reach this minimal threshold of pain that you want to go through before you take the jump and start, you know, for example, using Hadoop or Spark. Here, you can use the same tool from your initial testing with test data locally all the way to large-scale production on you know, dozens of machines and more. And to showcase how that work is then, now how, how to go from like a single container, for example, to a distributed setup. As a reminder, KSQL servers read and write to Kafka across the network. They are not running inside the Kafka cluster. They are not running inside the Kafka progress. You can run one server or many of them. And if you run many of them, they automatically form a KSQL cluster. Behind the scenes, what they're doing is they're forming a Kafka consumer group, if you know a little bit about how Kafka consumers work behind the scenes. That means if they are in the same cluster, they're in the same consumer group, and thus they collaboratively uh, and in parallel start processing your data. And there's nothing you need to do. Like, there's no coordinator that you need to run, et cetera. There's no master node or anything. All of this is being handled by actually the Kafka backend behind the scenes. So if you need to have like five servers running, you run five containers. If you want to have two running, just stop three and talk about that in a second. 
And similarly, because it's so lightweight to deploy, what we typically see and also what we recommend is that actually you deploy not just a huge, humongous case of a cluster inside your company, so actually quite the opposite, because you want to um, deploy a KSQL cluster, and cluster sounds very heavyweight. You could say like maybe a KSQL deployment or a KSQL application per project or per team or per use case. That also allows you to use different versions of KSQL against the same Kafka cluster. So some teams prefer to use only like true and tried versions of KSQL that they have been using for six months, only then they go to production with it. They can stick to these you know, older versions or then you can have you know, the very innovative teams in the company that can wreak havoc and make a lot of mistakes very quickly. They can use the very latest version or maybe even run of KSQL master, um, the master branch, uh, directly in production. So you can decouple teams and timelines very easily, which is super cool if you're in a company that has maybe more than 10 people working on that problem. So if you're like a small startup, it's super cool because you can get up and running like in a minute with this. But in a bigger company, often the problem is the organizational tooling and the organizational processes around that. So that also allows you to decouple teams and timelines very easily. And if you want to use KSQL, there are two ways you can do that. Here's the interactive usage, and I'll juxtapose the two in a second. With interactive usage, you start in one or more KSQL servers, and then you can interact with those servers now with your KSQL deployment through the CLI, the UI, or the rest of the API directly. The second way to deploy KSQL is in headless configuration. When you're doing this, the KSQL servers disable any interactive access, like the REST API is completely disabled, and the way they know what to process is through a SQL file that you give them. And in this setup, like these three KSQL servers, they would form a you know, KSQL deployment, a KSQL cluster. They would only run those queries that are predefined in a SQL file that you give them. And that is pretty cool for companies that want to have you know, a clear audit trail, what is being pushed to production, what is not, that they can roll back if need be, and that, in general, should fit into their existing CI CD pipeline where you want to prevent human mistakes happening in production. So this allows you to lock down KSQL and minimize any mistakes you know, for human operators. So an example journey often looks like this. So people have an idea, they want to try this out, so what they do is they have an interactive KSQL uh, setup where they're just you know, typing their queries, seeing what works, what doesn't, and then they're making good iterations on that. And come production, you know, then you know what, you're gonna, uh, what you want to do. You also have an idea about like, the capacity that you would need. Do I need like, one of them? Do I need like, 10 of them, etc.? <laughs> then you would run a headless KSQL deployment with you know, predefined sets of queries. So very simple, and you can combine them as well. That said, there are, of course, also other people that use interactive KSQL in production as well. So also an option if you're fine with that. Um, we've seen that not just for people that uh, work in the line of business that are actually like building the product, or let's say the fraud team, the personalization team, or whatever, but also people that work in operations where they have a way to use KSQL to look into the, the flows of data in Kafka. So now let's talk about something that is hopefully even a bit cooler if you're interested in the, the techie and, and conceptual side of things. So something that we already stressed with Kafka streams in Kafka and something that we're also stressing in KSQL is what we call the stream table duality. Now, what is that and why should you even care? So here's an example from the previous slides. Maybe it was hard to notice, but in some cases, we actually showed SQL statements that created streams, and in other cases, we created tables. Okay, oh, what is that, right? What, what is the difference there? So I'll talk about that in a second. The most important point is, in practice, most use cases that you implement, and even you know, the infamous word count, is an example of such a use case. You need both streams and tables. So if you have only streaming tools, you build the table part <laughs> yourself. If you only have the database tables, you build all of the streaming part yourself. And that kind of sucks. I mean, I've, before I joined Confluent, I was you know, using those technologies, not building them. And it was really, really hard. Like all of this, you had to implement yourself. And that's why for Kafka, we decided, and for KSQL, we decided, no, this is something that should be working out of the box. Like the batteries should be included. And let me tell you why this is so important. First thing is, what is actually a table? 
So if you look at this example here, you have a table on the left side that is undergoing mutations from top to bottom. And what we can do is we can do change data, data capture on the table, which means we're recording the mutations against that table. That gives us a stream, a change log stream, in the center column. And then we can use that information, this stream, to reconstruct the table for any particular point in time. Cool part is that we can also do that on a different machine in a distributed environment. So uh, I blocked about that, like the, the bottom link is, I blocked about that in length um, recently where you use Scala code to juxtapose that, including Kafka Streams code and KSU code to explain the relationship between those concepts. Here's a sneak peek. So here is a, a stream, and you're turning that into a table of the latest user locations per user. So the, the stream is an input of user locations. You know, Alice is in Paris. Now Alice is in Rome. And you see how the table is changing over time as new input data is being processed. Now we're looking at the same example, but at the top there is now the change log stream for the table. And as you can see here is, in this specific example, the stream at the top is a copy of the stream at the bottom. And by the way, with Kafka Streams and KSQL, of course, you know, they realize that, and they don't duplicate your data unnecessarily. But here's about the concepts. So this looks a bit trivial, right? Because it, the data looks almost the same, top to bottom. So let's look at something different. What we're doing here is the same input data, the same input stream of users to locations, and now we are counting how many locations a particular user has visited. You know, a more than trivial example could be you have frequent flyers computation if you're an airline, for example. And what we can see here, the change log stream for the table at the top is now a bit different. Now we're seeing numbers per users being captured in that change log stream. So there is a clear relationship between a stream is a table as a stream is a table. And with KSQL, you can explore that in your applications. And the core realization of that is, if you have a stream, you can get to a table by aggregating that stream. That could be, for example, counting, it could be summing, it could be top K analysis, and so on. So to get, uh, to, get to a table, you take a stream and aggregate it. And, or in some sense, like you interpret that stream in a, in a particular way. And if you have a table, you get back the stream by just looking at the change log of that table. And that's also why these two have such a close relationship. They are two sides of the same coin. And that's also why Apache Kafka and databases are so much related. And um, if you've read up on, on that, you know, that concept, you know, the idea of turning the database inside out, this is turning the database inside out. But now, what does that mean for you as a user? So let's take a look at what you can do with that in KSQL. For example, Imagine you're doing change data capture from um, your no, MySQL or you know, whatever RDBMS you're using uh, database into Kafka. So you get, for example, customer information in real time streamed into Kafka through Kafka Connect. So there are connectors that you can use for Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, you know, whatever, to get data flowing in real time into Kafka. Then you can use KSQL to process those changes to your customer data in real time, and then send it to somewhere else with Kafka Connect again, like Elastic. So you can build an Elastic search-based dashboard or some other um, downstream workflow off of that. Similar example, let's stick to the customer table at the bottom, which is a table, but you can also have things like you know, connected cards in an IT scenario, which are writing updates continuously as they happen in real time to Kafka as well. What you can then do with KSQL is you can then join the stream and the tables in real time and then you know, send them wherever they are needed. And all of that with minimal effort. So that is example. So I've showed on previous slides already some code, so I'm going to do that here again, um, how we would do that with you know, KSQL statements. But this is how you benefit from this as a user. But in order to uh, also explain how KSQL dog foods itself <laughs> with the stream table duality, uh, let's take a closer look at what happens behind the scenes with KSQL. And we're going back to 
um, deployment or operational parts. So a key challenge in any distributed system, or specifically for stream processing, is fault tolerance. And for stream processing, it's primarily about fault tolerance state. So what is that? Imagine you have a computation that does any kind of stateful um, processing. Typical examples are you know, joins and aggregations, but also windowed aggregations in particular, where you're saying that I'm doing uh, five-minute averages of something, or I'm doing a stream-to-stream -stream join over an overlapping period of, let's say, 60 minutes. All of this requires state and managing that state behind the scenes for you. So in this case, um, you know, I used a, a blue database icon to represent the state of the server that is, because you asked it to do, some kind of stateful processing, you know, like a table join or an aggregation. Now, going back to what we showed very early, that you know, a table is a change log stream, is a table, and so on. What is happening behind the scenes is that KSQL is kind of streaming back, uh, doing a streaming backup of any state changes from the KSQL server that runs at the perimeter of the Kafka cluster to the Kafka cluster itself. Now, whenever that server happens to go down, like the machine crashes or Kubernetes decided to move <laughs> the container somewhere else, then the uh, replacement container, VM, server, whatever, will say, I will now restore the state of the failed machine to exactly the point where it was when it died, and only then I will resume the processing. So that is super cool. Like, there is nothing else you need to do. All of that happens behind the scenes and automatically for you. And uh, to show that in an example where there are a bit more servers around, imagine you have three servers. One of them dies and why, because they're doing stream processing, um, stateful stream processing work. Um, the, the failed state from the failed machine is moved over and split to the remaining ones. And I'm... Oh, Oversimplifying here a little bit, we're going to say like split and merge later on. Uh, so ignore that. I don't want to make it too complicated here in, in a little bit of time that we have. So what happens then behind the scenes is, if this happens, like server three dies, behind the scenes, because KSQL is built on Kafka streams, which is built on Kafka producers and consumers, a Kafka consumer group rebalance is triggered, which is essentially the event saying that, oh, something happened with one of the things that we're, that we're doing the processing. And as a result of that, processing, like the logic plus the state of the processing is being migrated to a new place. In this case, it's being migrated to the live servers that are still running. And similarly, if you bring back up server number three, the work is split again across the three instances, the three servers, and they start collaborating and, and share the work again. What happens behind the scenes again is another rebalance is triggered and then the logic is, and including the state, is being migrated. So that was the fault tolerance view, which is things happen unexpectedly and you rather have them not to happen. But it's the same, uh, it's another um, side of the same coin, because it's also relevant for elasticity and scalability. It's, there's essentially no difference between them, really, if you look at it. Uh, so you can also add, remove, or restart KSQL servers during live operations. Right? So if you think that you're a retailer and there is Black Friday coming tomorrow, you can add more machines to your live application as it is running to prepare for the onslaught of you know, customers buying things from your website on Black Friday. And once it's done, you just stop some of the instances that you no longer need because you, know, you don't want to pay for them <laughs> on AWS, for example, and it just continues working. There's no data loss, there's no duplicate processing, and so on. So how would that work? Very similarly, you decide, well, we need more processing power, so just start additional KSQL servers. What then happens is that the existing ones will start sharing some of their work, including sharing some of their state, um, to the new ones, which do the processing. And again, what happens behind the scenes is rebalance event, state is being migrated, and if you're done and you can scale down again, you can do the very same thing. You just stop some of them and they scale down gracefully. So which is super cool, and this is also why you can easily run not just KSQL, but also Kafka Streams application that's say containerized on Kubernetes, because there's not much you need to do. You just start as many or as little containers as you need. So as I mentioned, I had to apologize a bit because it's a bit not simplified, so I didn't talk about like threading model or what stream tasks are, because that is where 
um, Kafka makes assignment between input data, state, and the processing. So I ignore all of that here because it's otherwise a bit complicated to show on, on one slide. Um, but you can read up on that in the Apache Kafka documentation how that all works behind the scenes. So to wrap up, So if there is only one thing that you should probably remember for today is that KSQL is the streaming SQL engine for Apache Kafka. So if you like to use SQL in order to express what you want from your data, KSQL is a great tool if your data is in Kafka. It has a bunch of nice properties. Some of them I just alluded to. Um, I ignored that it can do exactly once processing. I ignored that it... Um, integrates natively with Kafka security, so you can encrypt data in transit between you know, the KSQL uh, servers and your Kafka cluster. You have authentication and authorization, you know, particularly now here in Europe, when you want to prevent um, people from you know, accessing sensitive data in your Kafka installation. You can do that also with KSQL. It, uh, it fits right in. Um, I didn't talk about event time processing, but this allows you, for example, to reprocess data with KSQL without case you're thinking that, oh, you're telling, you're reading back like one month of production data, and if you're not having event time processing support, case you would otherwise think that, oh, this just happened right now. Like one month of traffic happened right now. Oh God, alarm bells, DDoS attack, fraud, whatever, right? So, and with event time processing, what you can ensure is that data is actually being processed tomorrow as it was being processed today. So, hope that was a good summary. If that was interesting to you, um, here are some pointers. So um, the KSQL project is on GitHub. Feel free to you know, go there, take a look. Uh, even more encouraged to you know, contribute some code or ask questions, tell us what works, what doesn't. And uh, if you're really interested, we are always hiring at Confluence. So if you're interested in that and not just working on distributed systems, but also working in a distributed team, you know, just come talk to me or come talk to us. I'm more than happy to chat. Thank you. And I think we have time for like question? a few questions. Um, <clears throat> so um, whenever you do an operation um, that requires uh, some kind of uh, state, some aggregation, as you were saying, mm -hmm. you're generating a, a, a table. Um, now, you have local RocksDB that's holding your state store, essentially. Is there, every time you do an operation, it sends data to Kafka, and then Kafka reads it back as the change log to build the store state? Is, is that what's mm -hmm. happening? I, I try to reformulate your question because I think you're asking a question underneath that. Um, and let me go back to that. This slide. This slide, I think you're kind of referring to. Correct. Which is, when we're doing stateful computation in KSQL, and by extension also in Kafka streams. Um, what is happening behind the scenes in order to ensure fault-tolerant processing, so we're like, right, you don't want to miss to process a transaction like a payment if a machine fails, and also you don't want to process it more than once. <laughs> um, what is going on there? And then I think this is also part of your question, is this efficient? So, and of course, this is like the high-level overview. What is happening is that all the computation that happens on a particular case server happens locally. So you refer to that as, you know, we're using behind the scenes RocksDB as a, a local uh, storage engine for doing that work. Yeah, so that is what is happening. What then is also happening, which is the second part of your question, is that for fault tolerance reasons, these changes to RocksDB, right, the, the state and the storage part, is being backed up to Kafka, and is this efficient? I said, yes, this is pretty efficient, so there are a lot of optimizations that are being done behind the scenes, so that, you know, we're not, if you're getting one million input records, that are mutating a table, you're not sending one million records to the changelog topic there. So there is some, let's say, um, let's say compaction <laughs> being done for these updates so that this is actually rather efficient. Um, the feature that you would look up for in um, the documentation would be record caching, which allow you to uh, tune, you can also tune it in case you go about, for most use cases, you not, don't need to look at that. Um, this allows you to say how many of these, let's say, intermediate updates, intermediate results would need be compacted, like squashed away, 
before it is being sent into such a topic or before it is sent to a downstream operation as well. So that, that is optimized a lot behind the scenes because you're right, this requires a round trip across the network or at least like one round trip across the network. Hi, um, first of all, thanks for the talk. I would like to know if it's possible to use KSQL when your messages are encoded with formats like uh, protobuf and especially when you publish a schema update. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure whether the, the microphone is recorded or not. So the question was about supported data formats, and particularly if, you know, if schemas are involved. At the moment, KSQL supports three broad categories of data. One is you know, delimited thing like CSV data. One is JSON. And one is Afro. Afro is an example of, you know, uh, that from this schema. Um, Protobuf is currently not supported. Um, so no, no, there, there's no Protobuf support. The reason why that is not is because currently we're wrapping up work on integrating um, struct support. So, you know, very good support for nested data. And once we have that, then we're looking at, you know, opening the kind of forums to have, like, pluggable data formats, including Protobuf. So, uh, thank you for your presentation. Cool. So, we're running out of time. If you have more questions, you know, just ah. hit me up after. Yeah, we are <laughs> running out of time. Okay. If you want, uh, you can uh, meet him later. Thank you very much. Thank you.